guys, it's Donkey Tech Support here, and today we're building and testing a $1,500 all AMD PC. And here are the parts we are using. Now, this is not remotely the best bang for the buck PC, but that's not really what we're going for. So we're using an old Fractal Design Node 804 case. It doesn't have a tempered glass side panel, but I really like the brushed aluminum front panel and the overall design. Plus, it's a cube design, which I really like. Of course, if you're building your own system, go with a case that you like. The CPU we're using is the brilliant AMD Ryzen R5 3600, and we could use the stock uh, rate stealth cooler, but we need a bit of bling. So I went with the Corsair H115i RGB Platinum. We're also using 16GB of the gorgeous Corsair Dominator Platinum RGB memory, rated at 3600 uh, C18 or CL18. This is BDI, uh, it's not the best BDI, but it's good enough, and we're just going to use the XMP profile for, for this test. And we're just going to use the XMP profiles for now. We're only using one drive in this build, the 2 terabyte Intel 660p M.2 NVMe SSD. This is not the fastest N NVMe SSD on the market, but I got it for the same price as one terabyte of the faster uh, Corsair drive, I can't remember the name and I'll take capacity over speed for now. We're also using a MSI B450M Gaming Plus motherboard, more on that later. The GPU of choice is the Asus Strix 5700 XT for better or worse. Powering the entire system is a 650 watt EVGA GQ gold rated power supply. We're also switching out a couple of the stock fans with some 120mm fractal design Venturi fans because they're all black. All in all, this system comes in at about $1,500 with the current prices I could find on PC Part Picker. I must admit I am a fan of the M80X form factor and as such we are using the MSI B450M Gaming Plus motherboard in this build. I was gonna go for the motor, but sadly it was not in stock, so the slightly cheaper B450M Gaming Plus had to step up. The motherboard is actually slightly smaller than a full-size M80X motherboard, such as the Mortar, and, and you only get three fan headers on this board, so that's something to keep in mind. However, the Strix card also has a couple of fan headers, so we end up with five in total. And there's a couple of fan headers on the AIO that we're using to cool the CPU. This board only features two DIMM slots, so in theory that's good for memory overclocking. Uh, and for today's build, two slots are plenty. It only has one full-size PCIe slot and one M.2 slot. The other PCIe slots are located below the full-size one, so if you're using a triple slot card like the Strix here, you will not be able to use those. This board has BIOS flashback, which we will have to use to get it running. And the latest Agisa version for this board is uh, 1.0.0.3 ABBA which is supposed to help with boost speeds. Instead of manually overclocking, we will be using Precision Boost Overdrive and Auto OC. The Corsair Dominators are way more expensive than their cheaper Vengeance line, so this is one area where you could save some money or alternatively go with 32GB if you feel the need for that. Another area where you could save some money is the cooler. You could go for the H100i, which is a 240mm millimeter radiator which is uh, in which more cases support uh, or you just you could just use the stock cooler as well it's perfectly fine it's it's not brilliant but in my testing it's done okay the, the case is obviously a subjective choice and as i mentioned before i really like the sort of stealthy look of the node 804 in the stock configuration it also has space for a ton of hard drives, but all of that is removed to fit the water cooler and have some space for the cables. Cable management in this case is not the best, and neither am I, so I try to clean things up a bit, but in the back there is basically a bunch of cables just bundled together. The Intel 660p drive uses QLC storage, and I believe that is usually regarded as the worst kind, but it's still better than a mechanical drive in my opinion, and there is one gripe I have with this uh, drive though, and that's the god-awful green PCB. It's not a problem on many higher-end boards which have a heat spreader that sits on top of the M.2 SSD, but on this board it's right there in the open. 
I would even prefer it to be positioned below the GPU, as it is on a B350 mod Tomahawk. Temperature-wise, temperature maybe not the best, but at least it would be covered up. Anyway, I think this system turned out pretty good, but how is performance? Let's first look at GPU temperatures, as that was one thing I was concerned about since there is no airflow to the fans of the GPU. Here we see the GPU temperature while running Superposition 1080p Extreme. The GPU temperature maxed out at 85 degrees Celsius, while the hotspot temperature reached 102 degrees Celsius. Pretty toasty if we're honest. The memory temperature was also at a rather alarming 94 degrees Celsius, while the VRM topped out at 90 degrees Celsius, which is it's hot but safe. The fans were spinning at 2500 RPM and it was quite noisy as you can imagine, so obviously we have an airflow problem here. The solution was to mount one 140mm fan and one uh, 120 millimeter fan in the top of the case. You could of course go with the two 120mm or two 140mm, but this is what I had at hand. And these fans were plugged into the fan headers on the GPU, the Strix card. There was really no point in having these fans as intake because the air would have a hard time reaching the GPU. So instead they are set to exhaust the hot air out of the case. To aid in airflow I removed the very restrictive filter that is mounted behind the top mesh panel. I'm not going to worry about the dust here as there are 4 fans that are exhausting air in the top of the case. So after doing that I re-ran Superposition at 1080p Extreme and here are the result. So this is a much more acceptable result. Essentially all the temperatures has now dropped by 10 degrees Celsius and the fan speed is at a much more acceptable sub 1900 RPM. This is an example of how important it is that your case is able to get rid of all the hot air that the GPU is spewing out into the case. Now let's look at CPU and VRM temperatures. So for loading the CPU we're using ADA64 stress test and keep in mind we are using PBO and Auto OC and as you can see the temperatures were quite toasty, especially considering we're using a 280mm AIO for cooling. I also played around with different fan speeds to see what effect it would have on temperatures and in order to better illustrate the results here are the trend lines for the temperatures. And as you can see, temperature is dropping as the fan speed is increasing. Not represented in this graph, but the motherboard was actually pushing 1.4 volts to the CPU during the stress test, with clock speed staying slightly above 4.1 GHz all core. So you could manually do a better all core overclock at lower voltage. I can, for instance, do 1.3 volts at 4.2 GHz but then you would miss out on the boosts to 4.3 and 4.4 GHz in lighted thread scenarios. And the CPU did hit 4.4 GHz on several occasions, as is reflected in the single thread performance in Cinebench R20, which we will look at in a moment. Now the VRM temperatures on the motherboard was only 53 degrees Celsius, so this motherboard seems to have plenty of overhead for a more powerful CPU. Now let's take a look at performance in some synthetic benchmarks. In Cinebench R20, the R5 3600 with PBO and Auto OC enabled got 3626 points in the multi-threaded test and 401 points in the single-threaded test. A very respectable result in my opinion. In Superposition 1080p Extreme, the score was 5259. In Firestrike Extreme, the score was 11,974 points, with a graphics score of 13,108 points, a physics score of 19,626 points, and in the New York Times by test, we got 8,804 points, with 7,003 points in the CPU test and 9,227 points in the graphics test. Now let's see about performance in a couple of games at 1440p. First off, in Rainbow Six Siege, now can we hit 144 frames per second with high settings and 100% render scaling? Well, yes we can, and then some. At 160.3 frames per second on average, with a 0.1% low at 114.7 frames per second, you can of course get even higher numbers with 50% render scaling if you so desire. Now, can we hit 60 frames per second in an adventure game such as Shadow of the Tomb Raider at the highest settings with TAA? And again, we are hitting the mark and then some at 70.2 frames per second on average. The 0.1% low here though is only 30 frames per second, so there is a chance you may feel some slowdowns in certain areas. 
And for the last game, we have the Division 2. I don't play this game competitively, and as such, I prefer image quality over high FPS. So, ultra quality settings it is then. And with a target of 60 frames per second, we actually hit 71.7 frames per second on average, with a shoot at 1% low of 51.7 frames per second, which is a very good result in my opinion. For more gaming benchmarks, you can check out my review of the 5700 XT Strix. So, in closing then, I am very happy with the performance of the system, the temperatures are good, the noise level is acceptable given the form factor, and overall I'm happy with how the system performs. Now, is this the best way to spend $1500? No, no it's not. But that's the beauty of building your own system. You decide what to spend your money on. Do you want the best bang for the buck in every part of your system, or do you want to prioritize looks over performance? Maybe there is a particular brand that you are more comfortable with. For instance, if you would rather build this system with an NVIDIA GPU like the 2070 Super, you could basically go with cheaper RAM and that would allow you to choose uh, one, one of the cheaper 2070 Supers over the 5700 XT. Or maybe you just prefer NVIDIA and would rather have a 2060 Super, well then you don't really have to sacrifice anything and you can just choose the 2060 Super. I actually tried the Aorus RTX 2060 Super in this case and it barely reached 70 degrees celsius with fan speeds of 1600 rpm, but I haven't built an all AMD system in many years, so it felt really good to be able to do that without having to make any major sacrifices in performance. If you feel up to it, let me know what kind of system you would build with $1500. Would you go ATX, Micro ATX or maybe ITX? What case would you use and so forth. Farewell for now.